Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good evening. Uh, we're going to continue the study on A.T. Jones, 1893 General Conference Bulletin. Uh, but before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the Sabbath, for the way that you work in our lives, and um, the things that you teach us. We just invite your spirit now into each heart, to each home, uh, that you can speak to us, that we can be drawn close to you, that we can know that you love us and care for us, and that you can um, help us to grow, that we can be a light uh, for others. We pray for our influence, Lord, that it will be for good. We pray for your Holy Spirit now to, to direct us in this meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> where we had finished off last Sabbath in the afternoon <clears throat> is we had looked at some statements in Isaiah dealing with Christ not having uh, a redeemer, not somebody who could redeem him. And I saw that there was no man. I wondered that there was no intercessor. So this idea that Christ in humanity experienced this separation from his father, uh, but he had no one to deliver him, but his righteousness, <clears throat> it, it sustained him. So Christ was delivered by his own righteousness. This is not something that we could experience. <clears throat> but here, um, we, we had read that because we were reading this paragraph talking about Christ, how he calls us brethren. So he says, this is why he calls us brethren and why we are to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. For he has been there. He has met <clears throat> every one of them. He has met each temptation to its fullest extent he has passed through all these things for us. Then he comes back and says to us, I will pass through them with you. Thank you. Dear. <clears throat> he passed through them alone for us first. Now he passes through them with us. I have trodden the winepress alone. Thank the Lord that he had the royal courage to do it alone trusting only the Father to be with him. And oh, how good he is not to ask us to try it alone. No, he comes and says, I will go th with you through all these trials. My brethren, he will go with you. So then, this is why we are not to count them strange. He calls us his brethren, and he has passed through every one of these trials and is well acquainted with them, and therefore we are not to count them strangers. Is Christ a stranger to trials? No. How many trials did he meet? All. How many trials that you will ever meet did he meet? Every one of them. To what extent did he bear the contest upon each one of the temptations? To the fullest extent on each point. With whom was he contending on these things? Satan. Satan knows more tricks and trials and temptations than any man would ever be obliged to meet alone, doesn't he? And he tried every one of them on my brother, did he not? He tried every temptation on Jesus. To what extent of his effort did he have to try each of them on Jesus? To the fullest extent. Did he not have to exert all the power he knows on each single point in the temptations and trials of Jesus? He did. Did not Satan try everything that he knows in every way that he could possibly invent on him? Did not he try it to the fullest possible extent that he could try it? Yes. Well, then, <clears throat> has not all of his reservoir of trickery and temptation and trial been exhausted on Christ? And has he not exhausted all the power that he has to use in any of these trials and temptations? Yes. Well, then, when I am in Jesus and when he is in me, how much power has Satan left to affect me with? The congregation says none. How many remaining tricks does he know to play on me? There are none. Do you not see then that when we are in Christ, we have the victory? We have it now. Victory is not the only word. We have the triumph. 
and we have it now. Now in 2 Corinthians 2.14, now thanks be unto God, when? Now, which always causes us, causeth us to triumph. When? Always. Is that so? The audience says yes. Always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge. How? By us. Is that so? And maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us? Where? Audience in every place. Think of it. When is it? Now and always, that is when, how, by us, where, everywhere. And I would like to know what in the world is the reason we have not the victory in Christ. I would like to know that what in the world is the reason we are not conquerors now. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Is it? Yes, that is the victory. Christ is our victory. <clears throat> His victory is my victory, isn't it? Yes. Well, then, when we are in him, we are perfectly safe. Are we not? Are we safe as long as we are in him? Yes. Do you remember way back in olden times, they had cities of refuge. And when some accident happened, as when an axe flew off the handle and struck a man and killed him. That must be where they get the expression flying off the handle. Anyway, uh, never thought of that. A handle and struck a man and killed him. And there was another man present as a friend standing by who perhaps might not take time to think deliberately, but would fly into a passion and would go about to take refuge in that matter right off. What was the man to do? He was just to strike out with all his might for the city of refuge and perhaps the other man after him with all his might. But he, but if he got in there, then what? He was safe and the other man could not touch him. And he was perfectly free. Suppose he went out of town, just as certain as he went out, and that other man found him. His blood was upon his own head. He was responsible. But he was safe there as long as he stayed in the refuge. And he was, he was to stay there until the high priest died. When the high priest died, the man was perfectly free. And he could go out anywhere. And the other man could not touch him at all, no matter how much he wanted to. Speaking of Abraham, it is said, by two immutable things in which it is, is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge. We have done mischief. We have sinned. What are the wages of sin? Death. Death. Then who is after us? Death. Who has the power of death? Satan. Then who is after us? Satan. And we fled for refuge to lay hold on that hope set before us. Where is that hope? The answer, in Christ. Who is our refuge? The answer, in Christ. Who is our city of refuge? The answer, Christ. Who is our enemy? The answer, Satan, death. Now then, when we are in Christ, our refuge, can Satan touch us? He cannot. How do you know? It says so. Suppose we go out before the priesthood closes. What then? Satan can, and he will smite us, and our blood will be on our, own, on our head. If we go out before the priesthood closes, we have no protection, and he will take us. If that man would remain in the city 10 or 15 years, he would have grown strong enough to meet his enemy, wouldn't he? He would have got experience there, and therefore he could say, I'm strong enough. Um, now I'm not afraid of any enemy. Now I can go out. I can go out now. I'm all right. That other fellow has gone away now and forgotten all about this. But he is not able to meet the enemy, is he? Where is he able alone to meet the enemy? In the city. And in the city, he does not have to meet him at all, does he? Voice, the city meets him. <clears throat> the walls of the city meet the enemy. That shield of faith <coughs> that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. That shield of faith, which is Jesus Christ, is the walls of our city of refuge. And the fiery darts of the enemy cannot get past it at all. Well, then, our strength and our, our safety forever is only inside of our refuge, isn't it? And then, when the priesthood closes, we can go everywhere in this universe. 
but not outside of Christ. Then we can go everywhere. And, and can the enemy do us any damage? No, sir. Let us stay in the city, brethren. Let us stay in the refuge to which we have fled, where our safety is. And when we are there, haven't we the victory? Yes, sir. In him, we have the victory. We can meet the temptation then with joy. Why? We have the victory before we meet the temptation, haven't we? Then cannot we be glad? Wouldn't you rather have a, a battle when you know you have a victory before you start in than to have no battle at all? Then let us do some of that kind of fighting. Come on, what is the use of being afraid? The victory is ours. Of course, if we go in calculating to be whipped, we had better not fight. The one who goes in expecting to be whipped had better run before he begins. The Lord does not want us to make such a fight as that. Our brother did not make such a fight as that. No, sir. And he doesn't propose that we shall. He wants us to know our victory. He wants us to know our confidence. He wants us to know our strength. He wants us to know the power that is ours. And he wants us to know our duty. And then... When the contest comes, we will know how to meet it. We meet it in him. We meet it by him. We meet it with the shield of faith and the fiery darts of the enemy are quenched. And there's no question about it. Then it is in suffering where we meet the power, the victory, and the elevating presence of Christ. When the trials come, we stand with him. And we know that we cannot stand without him. Count it all joy. Let us do it. Think it not strange when the fiery trials come as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Rejoice for as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed in you, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. Then we need gold tried in the fire to meet these trials. Do we not? Yeah. We, need, we need some. What's that? Chris, did you say something? I said amen. Okay. We need something that will stand the tests that will come. And this is what we have learned before. Those who bear every test have heeded the testimony of the true witness and will receive the latter rain that they may be translated. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is an interesting statement. We've, we've learned this before, as Joan says. Those who bear every test have heeded the testimony of the true witness. So the counsel of the true witness is the message to the Laodiceans, right? Gold tried in the fire, I salve and white raiment. And so those who receive this and heed this testimony, they receive the latter rain that they may be translated. Brethren, is there not a lot of good cheer in the thought that it is for that that the latter rain is to prepare for translation? No, where is the latter rain to fall and when does it? Now is the time for the latter rain. And when is the time for the loud cry? The voice says now, the voice in the audience. What is it to prepare us for? The voice says for translation. It brings good cheer to me that the tests that the Lord is giving us now are to fit us for translation. And when he comes and speaks to you and me, it is because he wants to translate us. But he cannot translate sin, can he? Then the only purpose that he has in showing us the depth and breadth of sin is that he may save us from it and translate us. Then shall we become discouraged when he shows us our sins? No. Let us thank him. That he wants to translate us and he wants to do this so much that he wishes to get our sins out of the way as soon as possible. Brethren, let us believe the Lord right along all the time. <clears throat> now, an interesting thought comes to mind. So we know that A.T. Jones here is in 1893. And why does he say that it's the latter rain, the time for the latter rain is now, and the time for the loud cry is now? What is it he believes? The Sunday law is near. Right, so he believes that the Sunday law is near. He believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. So it definitely parallels this movement 
as far as 9-11 is concerned. And we know that his message is from God because Ellen White testifies of this. She says that the message that was given at the 1893 General Conference was uh, the true message, that it worked uh, confession and repentance, that this was preparing a people. But we know that this work didn't continue, that this movement fails, right? A.T. Jones' movement that he's a part of there at that time fails in its mission. And they fail because of all the infighting that they can't get past. Things arise. Satan has come in. And as much as Jones says that everything was, that Christ has seen everything and gone through everything, unless they take Christ and are in Christ and allow Christ to be in them, they're going to fail. And of course they do, right? They don't, they don't succeed. Now, <clears throat> is this the only time in Adventist history that we have this sort of uh, message? Because we know that we have this message in the Millerite history. They believe that Christ was returning. We have this message here. Uh, in 1898 or 1888 and 1893, right? So Jones uh, is part of that history. Is Can we look at this history as just representing our history or is there, are there other histories that also from that time to our time also have this, this idea that Christ is returning I mean, Adventists aren't time setters, so Jones isn't setting time. But would we have this in each generation, is what I'm asking. Yes. Okay. So we've never looked for it before. But what we understand about the lines now, from our study of understanding the lines, is that we would actually expect that this has happened again and again. These failed reform lines in this progressive destruction of four, because we have the model for it. Now, I don't know how much people know about Shepherd's Rod, because the Seventh-day Adventists, um, we know that Shepherd's Rod is not correct, that Victor Hutoff was out of line, so to speak. It is, he was off track. But he wasn't as off track as people make out. I mean, it's, you know, to call somebody a shepherd's rod in Adventism is like to call somebody a fascist in the world. It doesn't really mean much. That is, I don't think most Adventists know what shepherd's rod, what Victor Hutoff stood for. And, and Jeff has pointed out that they're a counterfeit of this movement. Does anybody know why he says that? If I recall correctly, it's because one of the reasons is because they rely heavily on the spirit of prophecy. Okay. And they use the spirit of prophecy in similar ways that we do. Okay. Right. Now, they make some errors, right, which are pretty obvious that they did. But one of the things they do is they focus a lot on the Sunday law and they focus upon um, Ezekiel chapter eight and nine. Mm. Right. Right. So there's lots of things. If you look at the Shepherd's, Raw, Shepherd's Rod's message, it actually parallels our message fairly closely. But they over, they're always overzealous in certain parts of Scripture and they take it too far. Well, okay. So when Victor Hutoff first, he actually brought this to the General Conference. So if you look up the history of Shepherd's Rod, and I can't remember the year, um, but they brought this to the general conference that we needed to get back to the spirit of prophecy, that the church had gone off track. Um, and I'm just going to look up here. So I know this is it. So it was, uh, it was founded in 1929 by Victor Hutoff. Um, he was excommunicated. They call it here on Wikipedia in 1930 for promoting heretical doctrines. Uh, the official organization name was changed in 1942 to Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. 
but still referred to as the rod by both members and critics. Um, and then the group was headquartered at a property still referred to as, or, or property known as Mount Carmel Center near Waco, Texas, and reached its peak in the early 1950s with thousands of adherents before splintering into various factions after Gutev's death in 1955. So uh, the Branch Davidians, of course, are a branch of the Davidians. That's why they call Branch Davidians. So, um, uh, you know. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So uh, David Koresh was, ended up, en ended up owning that uh, property that Utah had started. But, um, so they had done here, I'm just trying to, to figure out here. So, um, so he was a Seventh-day Adventist member in a local California congregation. During the first quarter of 1929, Hutov came into conflict with church authorities over differing in interpretations of chapter 54 to 66 of the book of Isaiah. Uh, he believed that the church was becoming lax in its standards and needed reform. So some of his initial ideas weren't really very wrong. I mean, if you look at it there, uh, but he did have a sort of uh, fanciful way of looking at things. And so they did not take him seriously. And um, so anyway, the point that I'm making is that God has a true and a false message at every time. Now, what would we have? So I would look at that as, as a, a mixture of truth and error. Now, why does Satan mix truth and error together? We've talked about this many times. So it's more palatable. It's more palatable, and it also it uh, makes us not look at something because some because the error that Satan often mixes, uh, or the truth that Satan mixes into the error, is often things that we need. So it causes people to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Yeah. And so, so it's something that we, we need to understand. We need to understand of, because we need to know how to separate the precious and the vile. And if, if we have to be able to separate the precious and the vile, that means the two are mixed together. And it takes more effort to separate them instead of just yeah. you know, looking on the surface. <clears throat> So we know at the same time in 1893, we had Brother uh, Stanton and Brother, um, uh, can't, I always have trouble remembering the name of the guy, um, is it Canwell, doesn't sound right, that's the right, Brother Stanton, and, Canwell, 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 Canwell. Canwell. Yeah, Brother Cadwell, and and they're they're presenting a message that's that's saying that the church needs to be reformed. But at the same time, there is a true message, right? So, you know, it'd be something I, like right now. I'm not going to do a whole study of, of Adventist history, but I don't think that we understand Adventist history as well as we can, could have, because we only understand Adventist history as it's for the most part as it's been fed to us by the church. There's lots of Adventist history that we're just not familiar with. So, so God has been trying to bring truth to this movement all through this history, even during the four generations. And once we get to uh, 1989, most of the time these reforms were coming from uh, the ministry in some way. There would be different ministers. We know we have, for instance... Um, in the 18, or 1950s, we have, um, and through that history too, uh, even dealing the time of Shepherd's Rod, we have, um, um, oh, I can't think of his name. Louis F. Weir? No, well, we have Louis F. Weir, but the, the other Adventist minister, um, just can't think of his name. I'll think of that. Andreasen? Andreasen, Emil Andreasen. Right, so we have true messages being presented but we also have false messages being presented. And these false messages create a resistance to the true. 
So it's just something that came to my mind here as I was uh, reading this. So it's a little bit unrelated to what we're reading. Um, did I read this here? Yeah, I read that. So then we need something that will bear as severe a test when tried as gold is required to bear in purifying it in the fire. What does the counselor tell us to get? What does he tell us to buy? Always gold tried in the fire. That very thing is needed right now in order to meet the trials that are coming. Know the trials that are here. We do not care for what is coming. We need that now. We need that to meet the trials that are here. And that is the very thing that the counselor says, buy of me, I have a supply. He has a supply for he has manufactured. He has the thing that will bear the test for it has already borne the test. It has borne every test that will ever be required of anybody again. The test was born in his sufferings. Through sufferings, the gold is purified, made white, and tried, and perfected and proven to be the genuine article. We have the definition of that by the Spirit of the Lord. Gold tried in the fire is love. It is faith and love, read Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. In other places, it is expressed faith and obedience. What is obedience? Boy says the expression of love. In Steps to Christ, page 64, obedience is not a mere outward compliance, but the service of love. Then, when the testimony speaks of faith and obedience, it is simply faith which works by love. The expressions in the testimony of faith and obedience and faith and love mean the same thing as the expression of scripture, faith which worketh by love. They're simply different modes of expressing genuine spiritual faith. For in Christ, nothing availeth but faith which worketh by love. <coughs> now, Paul three times uses the expression in various ways, <coughs> excuse me, of, um, you know, circumcision availeth nothing, neither uncircumcision. And, and he uses three different uh answers to that the one is here the faith faith which worketh by love another place he says but the key, keeping of the commandments of god and another one he says but a new creature so we can see that faith that worketh by love is the keeping of the commandments of god but it's also wrought by becoming a new creature a new creature in christ so jones is focusing here upon the faith which worketh by love So these are just different ways of expressing genuine spiritual faith. Obedience is the service of love. And Jesus tells us to buy of him gold tried in the fire, which is faith and love. The faith which works by love, the genuine article of faith. What is it that is to be tried with severe fiery trials? Your faith, which is more precious than gold, though it be tried in the fire. Then you see, as every man's faith is to be so tried, he needs the faith that has stood the trial. Then we have the testimony. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus? No. They have not. The have is not in there. They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That is, they keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus. This, that is the genuine article. That is the faith which, in him, endured the test. That is the faith which met every fiery trial that Satan knows, and all the power that Satan could rally. That faith endured the test. So then, he comes and says to us, You buy of me that faith that has endured the test. Gold tried in the fire. So, in the expression, buy of me that faith that has endured, is not that the same line of thought that we have learned in let this mind be in you, that was also in Christ Jesus? When that mind is in me, that was in him, 
Will not that mind do in me precisely what it did in him? How is it that we serve the law of God anyhow? With the mind, I serve the law of God, Romans 7, 25. Christ in this world, every moment, served the law of God. How did he do it? With the mind. By what process of the mind did he do it? By faith. Then does he not tell you and me to buy of him the faith of Jesus? Did not the faith of Jesus keep the commandments of God perfectly all the time? And is not that the faith that works by love? Love is the fulfilling of the law. Then is not that the third angel's message when he says, Come and buy of me gold tried in the fire, love and faith and white raiment, righteousness of Christ, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So we see how it is now that the mind that was in Christ will stand all the trials that this world can bring. Is not the mind of Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Will the mind of Christ in him do differently from the mind of Christ in me or in any other man? No. The mind of Christ. Whose mind was it? Voice. The mind of God. God was in him in the flesh. How shall we buy? Read Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth. Which I need to drink some water here. Brethren, have we not become pretty thirsty by all that the Lord has said in the last few days? I know brethren who have come to me and talked, and they were just about perishing of thirst. They're almost ready to drop of thirst. Then these words are to you and me. Ho, just think, he wants to call the people's attention. So he calls loudly, ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come. When he said to Peter, come, could Peter come? Yes. What, come on the water? Voice on the word, come. Yes, by that word, Peter walked on the water. Then when he forgot the word and thought he was about to sink, he said, Lord, save me. He could not get him, could he? He started, but forgot the power of the word, and fa the faith slipped, and he thought he could not get to him, and he cried, Lord, save me. The Lord put forth his hand. He did not wait for Peter to get to him, but he put forth his hand and lifted him up, him up. My brother or my sister, if you have mustered up courage to start on the word, come, and have forgot the power of it, and your faith has slipped because of the storm that was about you, you can say, Lord, save me. And he reaches out his hand and will save you. Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come. He tells us to buy. And whosoever and whoever has no money, he will attend to the buying. He will see that we get the article. And that is also what he said to those who thought they had money and did not know they had none. But that means us. That means you and me. And he comes with those words, beloved and brethren, without money, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. The same thing is in Isaiah 52, 3. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. How in the world can we get back when we have sold ourselves? What did we get? Nothing. Now, if he should ask anything for us to get back, how in the world can we do it? We sold ourselves for nothing. And if it costs us anything to get back, that means everlasting ruin. Does it not? So then we must settle down on that one thing that does not cost anything for us to get back. Ye have sold yourselves for nothing, and ye have redeemed, been, be redeemed, ye shall be redeemed for nothing. It cost the Lord something, however. It cost him everything. But all this he gives us so that it costs us nothing. The price was paid, but not by us. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ears, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. What is it that you are to do, that your soul shall live? 
voice, hear. Do you hear, brethren? Have you heard the invitation? Do you live? You have heard of the creative power and the wonder-working power of Jesus Christ. Having heard it, do you live by it? Do you live in him and by him and to him? Back there in the wilderness, Moses lifted up a serpent. And what were they to do? Look and live. And as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, and they were to live, so the Son of Man was lifted up, that whosoever should look to him should live. But here it stated, hear, and ye shall live. God had the plan fixed that we should that he, we should speak and live, but Moses, Moses spoiled it. In the 20th of Numbers, we read that the Lord told Moses there, when the people were murmuring for water, to go and speak to the rock, and it should bring forth water. Moses went up and said, Hear now, ye rebels, much we f- must we fetch you water out of this rock? And he smote the rock twice. It was then that he spoiled God's splendid figure, that he would have set up that all we were to do was to speak, for the rock had been smitten when they entered the desert. The record says, when the people were thirsty, the Lord told Moses to go up to Horeb, and that he would stand before him on the rock, and he told him to smite the rock with the rod that was in his hand, that the people might drink. He did, and the water flowed out. What was the rock? Voice, Christ. Then why did he smite the rock the second time? Christ is not to die the second time for you and me. The Lord wanted to show us this in that splendid figure that he was about to set up. But Moses forgot his word. He did not believe him and thought that he was to do as he did before. He forgot that the Lord said, go and speak to the rock. So he smote it. And spoiled the figure. Then God said unto him, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Brethren, the Lord himself cannot keep us from sinning when we do not believe him. Do not forget that. The Lord did not intend that Moses should do as he did. But Moses did not believe the Lord. Why did not the Lord keep him from sinning? He could not when Moses did not believe him. Then it becomes you and me, whenever God speaks to us, to just take him just as he says. Then he will keep us from sinning. So we can see that the power here in what Jones is presenting from God's word, using this this idea of thirsting. And this illustration of the water from the rock. And and this is just another one of those illustrations that we have in scripture. You know, Christ being the bread of life. He's the water. All of these different examples of what Christ is, the good shepherd. Um, And they illustrate something. Now, what's being illustrated here, though, um, we we have the, the hindsight to look at this history. So one of the things we're looking at when we're looking at what Jones is presenting here he believes the mighty angel of revelation 18 has come down and he's giving the third angel's message right he's preparing for the sunday law and he's giving a true message right it's not some false message but what does it say about our history because his history failed does our history also fail Okay, so so we know our history does have failures in it. This idea that Parminder and Tabo were promoting that are there there's lines of failure and lines of success. I don't know if people remember that. Um, these were false lines because in a sense every line is a line of failure. Because what fails? The people. The people always fail, right? In the end, what's going, why, why do God's people end up in heaven? God's mercy and grace. Well, God's mercy and grace. 
they repent, they turn from their sin. Okay. But it's just that Christ is now victorious in his people. When Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim them as his own. All we have ever had is man's character. Man's character will always fail. Each one of these lines illustrates this. These reform lines illustrate the fact that without Christ, we cannot be victorious. There, there's more to it than that. But, but that's a really simple way to look at it, is that when we have a line... We have, we always have, in every reform line, we have a three-step testing prophetic message. After the third, you're going to have a fourth. But the first fourth, the one that follows right after the third, is always a falling away. Right? We've seen that in every reform line. And each of these reform lines, what we're going to see in this reform line that we are in that leads into the Sunday law, is a falling away of humanity. But we're also going to see the victory in Christ, because in every one of those reform lines, we also have the cross of Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. We we agree that in every reform line, there's always the cross. Mm -hmm. And did Christ ever fail? No, never. So if we are in Christ, when that final reform line comes, Christ will have succeeded. Humanity will not have succeeded. Humanity always fails. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood because I believe that that victory of Christ succeeding is his character perfectly reproduced in his people. But it's Christ's character, not man's character. Exactly. Christ told his disciples that night that they would all forsake him and flee. They said, no, we will not. No, sir, you are mistaken. Peter said, though all forsake thee, I will not. Before the cock crew, he denied him three times, although he had said, though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Who was right? Christ. They all said the same thing, but they all fled because of their unbelief. If they had believed that what he had said, would they have fled? Wouldn't he have saved the flock? Brethren, what we want to do is believe the Lord. Undoubtedly, Moses thought when the Lord told him to speak to the rock that he meant to say, as he did before, to go and smite it. He should have listened to what the Lord said. And that is for you and me. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding of all things. <coughs> so then, what are we to do? What we are to do is to look and live, hear and live. Speak and live. Let us do it. The rock has been smitten. Speak. And he will give forth the water of life. Brethren, that is from our counselor. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And we have it further. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize. And you remember the description that we have already had of that raiment. The figure is, it is that garment that is woven in the loom of heaven, in which there is not a single thread of human making. Brethren, that garment was woven in a human body. The human body, the flesh of Christ, was the loom, was it not? That garment was woven in Jesus, in the same flesh that you and I have, for he took part of the same flesh and blood that we have, that flesh that is yours and mine, that Christ bore in this world, that was the loom in which God wove that garment for you and me to wear in the flesh. And he wants us to wear it now, as well as when the flesh is made immortal in the end. What was the loom? Christ in human flesh. What was it that was made there? voice the garment of righteousness and it is for all of us the righteousness of christ the life that he lived for you and for me that we are considering tonight 
That is the garment. God the Father, God, was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. His name shall be called Emmanuel, that is, God with us. Now then, he wants that garment to be ours, but does not want us to forget who is the weaver. It is not ourselves, but it is he who is with us. It was God in Christ. Christ is to be in us, just as God was in him. And his character is to be in us, just as God was in him. And his character is to be woven and transformed into us through these sufferings and temptations and trials which we meet. And God is the weaver, but not without us. It is the cooperation of the divine and the human, the mystery of God in you and me. The same mystery that was in the gospel, that is the third angel's message. This is the word of the wonderful counselor. Voice, was not the character woven without us? Yes, but it will not become ours without us. So we are led through these fiery trials and temptations to be partakers of the character of Christ. And these trials and temptations that we meet reveal to us our characters and the importance of having his. So that through these same temptations that he passed through, we become partakers of his character, bearing about in the body the righteousness of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, which is the dying, bearing about the dying of Christ. Same thing. So here, uh, Jones brings out a very important point that Adventism has not been able to pick up. This is a thread that we have severed and not wanted to uh, to have woven into this fabric of our righteousness. That is, many Adventists believe that since there's not one thread of human devising or making in this garment of Christ's righteousness, that it is just done apart from us completely. Mm-hmm. That we're sinners and Christ comes and he places this robe of righteousness over our filthy garments of actually seen an Adventist minister at a camp meeting uh, present that is how it's done. But we know that he can't present that place, that robe of righteousness over our filthy garments, can he? He has to change them. He has to remove the filthy garments. Because that character isn't something that's just done in heaven. It's something that's done on earth. Christ did it in our nature. And he has to do it again in our nature, in each one of us. So this isn't just some play acting. It's not something just in the record books of heaven that we're considered righteous. We actually are transformed and changed. And Jones understands this principle. But it's something that most people, when they talk about the in Christ motif, you know, it's just in Christ, all these things are done. If we just accept Jesus, then it's counted as in Christ. But Jones understands it's Christ in us and us in Christ, that cooperation of the human and the divine. He says, of course, the garment was woven without us. And the beauty of it comes in that we are to have the garment as complete as he is. We are to grow up into Christ until we all come in the unity of the faith. It is the same message still until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How tall are we to be in character before we leave this world? As tall as Christ. What is to be our stature? That of Christ. We are to be perfect men reaching unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Who is the weaver? Voice is God. In whose eye is the pattern? God's. Many times, brethren, the threads seem all tangled when we look at them. The meshes seem all out of shape, and there's no symmetry at all to the figure. There's no beauty at all to the pattern as we see it. But the pattern is not of our making. We are not the weaver. Although the threads become tangled and the shuttle in the, and the shuttle as it goes through gets all clogged, and we do not know how it is all coming out, who is sending the shuttle? God sends the shuttle, and it will go through. You need never mind. 
if the threads get tangled and you can see nothing beautiful in it. God is the weaver. Can he untangle the threads? Assuredly, he will untangle them. When we look for the symmetry of the pattern and see it all awry and the colors intermingle and the threads drawn through this way and that and the figure seems spoiled, who is making the figure anyhow? God, of course. Whose loom contains the pattern of the figure in its completeness? And who is the pattern? Christ is the pattern. And do not forget, no man knoweth the Son but the Father. You and I cannot shape our lives on the pattern. We do not know him. We cannot see clearly enough to discern the one who shapes the pattern or to know how to shape it right, even if we were doing the weaving. Brethren, God is doing the weaving. He will carry that process on. God sees the pattern in its completeness before it is done. It is his eye perfected. It is in his eye perfected when to our eye it all seems tangled and awry. All right. All right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's how you say it. That's how you spell awry. I've yeah. heard awry, but I've never. Uh, <laughs> okay, tangled and awry. Are you sure? I'm not positive. Okay. Anyway, brethren, let him weave away. So if somebody had asked me, how do you spell a rye? I would have no idea. Anyway, now I do. A-W-R-Y. Okay, brethren, let us weave away. Let him carry on his blessed plan of weaving through all our life and experience the precious pattern of Jesus Christ. The day is coming. And it is not far off when the last shuttle will be shot through. The last thread will be laid on. The last point in the figure will be met completely and sealed with the seal of the living God. There we shall wait only for him that we may be like him because we shall see him as he is. Brethren, is he not a wonderful counselor? Oh, let us take his counsel tonight. Let us take the blessed faith that he has been tried and all that he tells us, for it is all our own. God has given it. It is mine. It is yours. Let us thank him and be glad. So Jones presents here a very powerful message. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, of course, you know, when I mean, I remember reading this years ago. Um, I def definitely didn't understand half of what Jones was saying. But as we go through an experience with God, as we yoke up with him, as we cooperate with him, these things become much and much, much more meaningful uh, to each one of us. Now, in addressing this, we know that um, going back to Caldwell and Stanton, brothers Cald Caldwell and Stanton, that they could see the problems in the church, but they couldn't see the problems in themselves. And the question is, why is that? Why can we not see the truth of this message of what God wants to see in us? And Jones' answer simply is we don't believe God. Because when he says that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, do we believe God? We don't. We think that applies to someone else. And we can we can we can point out who that is that God must be talking about. It'd be talking about the church or it'd be talking about some other people. But we don't believe that what God says because we don't believe that it's talking about us when he is. Right. So this is this is really what Jones is saying about the Laodicean message. But it's not bad news to know that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, that's actually good news. Because it's the truth. If God were to lie about us and say that we're all right, well, that wouldn't be very good news because we would still be in our sins. We would be deceived. So the message that's been coming to this movement now is to recognize that what God says about us is true that it applies to us, not to someone else. And then we can experience the everlasting gospel. Now, we also know that this everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. 
And so Jones also sees that, that the first, second, and third angel's messages are all part of the gospel. Because he, he quotes Alan White on that point. But in this movement right now, we have this same problem that happened after this time, the separation of prophecy, the first and second angel's message from the third. But we know, we've taught, you can't have a third without the first and the second. And the third is righteousness by faith, but the second is righteousness by faith. And so is the first angel's message, righteousness by faith. Because isn't righteousness by faith the gospel? Mm -hmm. It's the everlasting gospel. So if the everlasting gospel contains the first, second, and third angel's message, you can't just be talking about the third angel's message. Now, righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity or in reality. That is, it's worked out in the life. It's that third step. The first two steps are righteousness by faith, but not righteousness by faith in verity. Right? You would agree with that. <clears throat> Any thoughts that you have on this? I was going to say, just in regards to the three messages, Ellen White says that they come in their order. Yes. So they come in their order. Right Right now on Friday afternoons, um, we do study with studies with people in the building. And uh, right now we have three people coming to the study on a regular basis. And we've been going through the creation week and showing that this is an illustration of the everlasting gospel, that it happens in uh, as a three-step testing prophetic message. And that uh, the first message is the message of division, dividing the light from the darkness dividing uh, the firmament, the waters in the heavens, and the waters on the earth. And then the third one, which is the empowerment of that division, is dividing the land from the sea. And as we go through this, this uh, the, the order of creation, because this is how God created man in his image, it's also how he recreates man. It illustrates a recreation of man. So when we look at the experience that we have in this movement and we deny a step in the movement as being error, we end up rejecting the whole kit and caboodle, I guess, the of package. the gospel. Yeah, the whole package, right? So you can't walk along the path that God has set out for us and deny the light that had brought you this far. Or you can't just accept what you want to accept. Well, you can't pick and choose. That's what I'm trying to say. He who, is, he who offends one point is guilty of all. Yeah. So God is leading us through this experience. And the reason we're studying Jones particularly, because we could have just studied righteousness by faith on its own. But you can see how studying Jones, how reading here where Jones believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, that Jones is actually going through a reform line that's going to be a failed reform line. And, and we haven't done this yet. And maybe this is one of the things that we're going to do as time goes on, is that we're going to understand, just like we did with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, that we're going to take each of these these histories and lay them out on a line because we haven't done that with Jones. Jones has a personal line in which he's a part of a message. We look at the church, but when we zoom into these different dates, if we zoom into 1888, uh, we can see that Jones has a line, a personal line. Does that seem reasonable to people? No, you guys yes, looks like it does. Yeah. And, and, and we see this because we even see it in our own lives that we have a personal line. But sometimes our personal lines are intertwined because of where we are in the message. They're intertwined with other people's lines. That is, they're intertwined with the reform line, not just our own personal reform line. And so Jones has this as well. And so when we look at these four generations, just as we're doing right now with the period this, uh, with the judges in the morning studies, we should be able to go through Adventist history and see the same type of parallels uh, that we, we saw um, with the judges in our history. 
And we should be able to see that these parallel Adventist history, but also our history as well. And that's what we've been seeing with the 1893 General Conference Bulletin messages of Jones, is that his, his history typifies our history. Now, um, the other point that, that we've, we've found in our other studies is that we are being led to the upper room. That is, this movement, if it's going to move forward, has to go to the upper room. That is, we need confession and repentance. Because the condition that the movement is now, it will never move forward. If the disciples had not gone to the upper room, what would have happened? Well, they definitely wouldn't have moved forward. God would have had to work in some other way. And we, we sometimes believe because we're in this reform line and God has been leading us that our reform line has to succeed, right? That God has to use us. Because God has other people. You know, if these stones, if, if these people didn't cry out, the stones would cry out, Jesus says. God has a purpose and a plan. Now, we can be a part of it or we cannot. Well, he doesn't really even need any of us. No. No. He chooses to use us. Yeah. So God has, has condescended to humanity and he's chose to use us. This movement, he, he chose Jeff. He chose different people to give a part of the message. God's not dependent upon any one of us for his work to be accomplished on this earth. Because there are others who God is using presently. It may not be manifest in the same way that our understanding is manifested. In some ways, God meets um, how that history unfolds. It's particular to the different people that are involved in it. Right. This movement has is tied up with chronology, and God has chosen that. But he's also chosen people who have an affinity for chronology, right? I mean, if I had not obeyed God, I wouldn't be there on October 13th, 2018, measuring 391 and a half days. But if I wasn't there, God, somebody would be there doing something else. Something would have happened, right? So... God chose to use me and with the particular abilities that I had. But if it was someone else who had different abilities, something else would have been manifested. That would have just been a different history, right? History would have been different, but it would have been the same. That is, it still would have accomplished what needed to be accomplished. So we just have this reality that we're in right now with looking at Jones, his history, and recognizing that Jones' history could have been different. That the history of the Adventist church could have been different. That Christ could have come ere this. So Parmenter wasn't totally wrong when he said that. Said particularly. Well, he said that um, him and Tess had that presentation on... Uh, Oh, each line Christ could have come. Okay. Yeah, they're not wrong there. That's they, true. They, they weren't they completely wrong. Sense. Right. Yeah. Literally? Yeah, they mm -hmm. uh Parminder and Test used truth but twisted it, mm -hmm. mixed it in with their error. Yeah. Yeah. Because they believed that they were prophets. Yeah. And that uh yeah, well, they just wanted to be in control and have a cult. Yeah. So they got what they wanted, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's full of error, they right? Took it too far, yeah. So we have to want the truth and, and the truth is the gospel and the gospel will transform us because without the transforming power of Christ, without the transforming power of the gospel, we can never witness of Christ. We will only witness of ourselves. Well, we can't represent his character properly. Mm -hmm. So this is what Adventism is about. And, and so we need to understand this message of Jones. Um, Before we close, I just yeah. want to say one thing. So yeah. go ahead okay. and read. But... Well, no, no, I'm done reading that part. What? 
Yeah. This is really elementary, so I, I'm sorry if I bore some people, but obviously when we're talking about righteousness by faith, faith isn't like the Protestant definition of faith mm -hmm. where it's just, I believe in Jesus. And I, yeah, the word faith and righteousness by faith is referring to something very specific. It's referring to God's promise to Abraham that he would remove sin from his life. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to have faith in. Yeah. And it's, it's not a type of willpower where, you know, I have faith in God that, you know, he's going to get me what I want or, right. or yeah. you know, um, but faith is, is experience, right? Because you have, you have a type of faith, a childhood faith where we, we accept what our parents say. <clears throat> and that's the type of faith that we have to first come to God, but that faith has to be tested. And then we have a faith that is experience mm -hmm. that's tried. Yeah. yeah. And that faith is the faith that endures. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm calling myself out on this one. We have to have a faith that God is going to do what he thinks and knows is best for us in every circumstance. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so we're going to stop there. We, we didn't do as long tonight, but I'm kind of exhausted. And um, uh, so uh, next Friday, we're going to pick up his number 11 study. Um, uh, but I'm just going to read the one paragraph here just to close. So it's going to be the first paragraph that we're going to pick up next Friday. He says, the place where, where, where we were in the scriptures, you remember, in this series of lessons, is that counsel of the true witness. The second thing that he tells us to buy we studied the first the other night, the counsel of, the, of thee to buy gold tried in a fire, that thou mayest be rich. That was our study the last lesson. Our study tonight begins the next thing. I counsel thee to buy of me white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So one of the things we see, the condition in Laodicea is, if you think about it, is they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So that's false. Five things, right? Why is it five? Because the parable of the ten virgins. Okay, so this is the five foolish. But the gospel is three things, right? Gold tried in a fire, white raiment, and ISAF. Right? You need those three. That's the everlasting gospel. So... Um, so we will be looking at the white raiment now. And also remember, we talked about uh, Ellen White is the counsel. She's even though it's Christ, Christ uses Sister White. As the messenger of to the Laodicean church and that her name, <clears throat> Ellen, means a bright and shining white light, gold, ruled and white raiment, white. Right. So. Jeff brings this out in uh, Time Prophets uh, in a study that he did a long time ago. So, so when we're studying this, when we're studying this message to the Laodiceans, um, what Jones tells us is we have to believe what God says about us because otherwise we won't look for the remedy. Because think about it. He's offering us something. And if we say we're not Laodiceans, then that means we don't need the remedy that he's offering. Right? So if you think, well, that just applies to someone else, what you're saying is that other person is the one who's going to receive that blessing of gold tried in the fire, white, white raiment, and I salve. I don't need that. And so you're not going to receive it. So we need to believe God when he says that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the blessing that we have of fellowship, and for the way that um, you give us this special blessing on the Sabbath day. Things that you have shown us this week we have rejoiced in, but we rejoice mostly in the gospel, in Christ and what he has done for us. I pray that you can be with each person watching these videos, that you can touch their heart, that they can be drawn to you,
that they can continue down this journey. I pray, Lord, that we can recognize that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that we can receive the counsel of the true witness. That we can receive these gifts uh, that Christ has so dearly purchased. Help us, Lord, to be grateful for what you have done. Help us not to look at the tasks that are un, have not been completed yet in us, but to re rejoice in the work that you are now doing in us. Help us to trust that this garment that has not one thread of human devising, that you are weaving into our characters. Help us to trust, Lord, in the finished product because you are the master weaver. Help us not to trust in ourselves. Help us to see that we are indeed in need of you. Be with each person, we pray, and bring us together again. According to thy will, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.